<laughs> so for all the uphill jump fans out there, this might not be the bike. Uphill jumping is a big sport. It is a big sport. Yeah. 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 Hello and welcome to the Downcountry Field Test. Now, the Giant Trance has been in the range for many, many years, and it was introduced with 29-inch wheels back in 2018. This is the Giant Trance Advanced Pro 29-1. Now, what this essentially means is that this is the carbon version of the bike. However, it's important not to confuse this with the Trance X, which is a bike that we have previously reviewed. This is an entirely new bike. Whereas that bike features 135 mil of rear wheel travel, this bike has 120 mil paired to 130 mil fork. This bike has some pretty interesting features and let's hit this one straight and true. So it's got the new Fox Live Valve 1.5 system. Now my proclarity for German Trance Trio scooter aside, I'm something of a technophobe, so it's gonna be interesting to see how I get on with this new electronic system, especially for a man who still doesn't really know what TikTok is and definitely is from a bygone age. There is also a storage compartment in the down tube for all your normal gubbins. Now, it seems a little bit smaller than other brands, but it's still great to have it on the bike. The Giant features very similar numbers to some of the other bikes on test. Now I'm around six foot tall and have been riding this size large frame and I would say it's about right. Now the Trance has an adjustable geometry chip and we've predominantly been testing this bike in its low position. The bike is built around Giant's Maestro suspension system. So this uses two links that rotate in the same direction to take that rear triangle through its travel. The bike uses a trunnion mounted shock with a 50 millimeter stroke. The funny looking shock uses a latching solenoid valve to adjust compression via the electronic system that uses sensors on both the fork and the rear axle. There is another of these valves in the fork to change the compression setting on the fly. There are also accelerometers on the bike that can open up the suspension in a handful of milliseconds. The general idea being that these sensors can tell if you need more efficiency or more suspension action, and it can adjust the level of damping to suit. So the live valve has five modes, climb, commute, sport, comfort and open. I don't know quite what commute means, but hey ho. So we've been riding it a lot in the climb mode. This means that the fork is open on the climbs and on descents, the bike acts as if it is in the sport mode. The live valve mode can be changed via a button just here or via an app on your phone. So we are in beautiful Pemberton and we've got some bikes just like this one. My only concern that some of the riding here is a bit X trail, all mountain, well to Duro, and nowadays I'm more of an XC downcountry, light trailer, hybrid sort of guy, but I'm sure we'll find something. So how did this bike get on? And how did it get on specifically with that live valve technology? Well, it's time to find out. All right, that's enough of the details about the new Giant Trance and its fancy live valve suspension. Let's talk about how it actually performs out on the trail. Start with you, Henry, how's this thing climb? I think it climbs pretty well. You know, I think it's fundamentally a good climber and largely that's because you run quite a low amount of sag between 20 and 25%. A downhill bike would be a good climber with 20% sag. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, whichever candidate it is for the live valve, I'm very curious to see how this would ride without it. And I wonder if maybe kind of electronically assisted suspension could have a better home than a short travel already quite punchy, quite firm underfoot bike. Mm -hmm. How do you go on, Mike? Yeah, so I've ridden a trance without Live Valve and I've obviously ridden before this a previous version of Live Valve, the first version of Live Valve. And I'd have to say that, first of all, I do believe that the bike benefits from Live Valve. Um, even when it's running you know, close to 20% sag, which is Giant's recommendation, 20 to 25%, which seems a little, a little low. Um, it is an, an amazing pedaling bike in my mind. The live valve definitely adds some life to it for sure, um, but it's a lot more, the live valve blends into the bike's performance a lot more than the previous version. Can the live valve make it an amazing pedaling bike? Like if you turn the live valve off compared to when it's on, is there a drastic difference? Like it's, it, it, does it improve it? Last year, 
If you had asked me this, the previous version of Live Valve, yeah, there's a huge difference, night and day. So this is Live Valve 1.5, they're calling it. And yeah, the difference is definitely more subtle. And I think that's a good thing, Henry. Well, yeah, I mean, something I really liked about the Trans was actually its geometry. I mean, it's only, I think it's about six mil shorter than some of the longer bikes in terms of the effective top tube. But a lot of the geometry did feel a bit more in range in terms of your seated position. It made it easy to manipulate, manipulate your weight on, on the bike. In terms of live valve or not, like I said, I think, I think it is fundamentally a good climber. I think it's sometimes helped by live valve. We predominantly run it in the climb mode, mm -hmm. which is basically where you have an open fork um, all the time, even on the climbs, and it flicks between sport mode on the descents. Um, we should stop a minute there and talk about that open fork. Because mm. for me, when I think climb mode, I think everything should be firmed up just as efficient as mm. possible. So why is the fork open? Well, I think the fork's open for two reasons. I think what it does to your center of mass, having a fork just going into its stroke slightly more and happy to go into its stroke is going to keep potentially your weight you know, on the front axle more. I think also hitting obstacles, I know it can change in an instant, but for me, I think I preferred the, the open fork over the um, sport mode all round. I felt there was more balance on the climbs. I felt it was a bit more poised, actually. We should also probably talk about the weight of this bike. I think it's at 29 and a half pounds. That makes it the heaviest on test. You know, these are supposed to be pretty light down country machines. So did that hold it back at all? Did you notice it? Potentially. I mean, it was the slowest, joint slowest in the efficiency climb. And interestingly enough, on a it was 243 with climb mode and 245 with fully open mode. The system works, everybody. So I told you, seconds. Henry. <laughs> I mean, it's it's mad. It, I think even going into this, I mean, I'm someone that isn't overly um, keen on any electronics. You hate it. Bike. Yes. Yeah, I do. I mean, for me, I was like, if only this bike will be as good as a bike without any electronic suspension. That was yeah. my hope for it. And that was my ambitious hope. We're going to talk about how Live Out feels on the descents in a few minutes, but I just want to ask Henry another question here. Do you think, just bottom line, do you think this bike is a better climber because of Live Elf? I think there's no way to tell. Well, I mean, you could just turn it off and ride it. No, because that shock is, you know, it's optimized for a Live Out, having yeah. it in fully open. I would like to put a non Live Valve standard Fox shock on there and then see how it goes. So I think the bike definitely climbs better with live valve. Like I know the shock isn't meant to be run without it turned on. Mm -hmm. I did that anyway. And it's a very active climber in my mind. Yeah, the bike climbs better with live valve. So Henry, you're not a fan of the live valve, it sounds like, but having ridden the old version, I mean, to me, this one just sort of disappears into the background more. And the bike doesn't, it doesn't feel quite as firm and efficient feeling as the previous version. The previous version felt like, Boom, like you're locked out, you're going up the hill. This doesn't give you that. And I think for that reason, it's gonna to appeal to more riders. I think it makes for a wider envelope of performance. I think you're probably right. I mean, the highest compliment I can give Live Out is that sometimes I forgot I had it. But if it wasn't for the haywire of cables on the front, I might have forgot entirely. But it's more expensive, it's heavier, and at best it performs as well as a bike without it. All right, so we mentioned it is the heaviest bike. Did that affect it on the climbs? What were your results like for the time portion of that? So the timed single track climb, this was the slowest. So again, with the efficiency test, it was the joint slowest and it was the all out slowest on the single track climb. And to be honest with you, it didn't feel sluggish. Mm. I don't really know where the time went, especially because it's probably one of the more, um, in terms of how your weight sits on the bike, it's one of the more sure footed stuff and kind of tight switchbacks. Did you stop at any point during the climb to change a mode? Maybe that's where you lost some time. I think that I did actually charge my battery halfway. <laughs> there we go. It. <laughs> it's actually 12 hours slow now. Oh, it. it all makes sense. <laughs> I rode a Giant with Live Valve last season, and I mean, it just didn't work. We were testing it in Squamish, pretty rooty, pretty rough and steep, but nothing out of line for a trail bike. And it literally felt like the rear tire had 50 PSI and it. it was crazy. This, in comparison to that, is amazing. It, it doesn't, I don't feel it turning on and off. I don't feel the difference as much, but I know it's still making a difference. Now let's move on a little bit from the live valve. I want to know how the bike itself works, like the geometry of the bike, how it handles. Live valve is all well and good, but how does the bike, it's got new, ge new geometry for this year. Yeah, I mean, I really liked the geometry actually. I thought it was about on the money for the trail bike. It's slightly steeper in the seat tube than some of these other bikes, and it's not a slack or something like the Rocky, but for these downcountry bikes, it seemed right on the money. I think that 
it was a really well handling bike. It's quite high on the front. I think this and the Niner both occupy a space as more of the kind of traditional 120mm trail bikes yeah. as opposed to your downcountry bikes. They can do the more aggressive things. They're, they're a bit higher at the front. And so when it gets steep, you never get that feeling of going off something and getting your weight pulled forwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think it's a very versatile bike. However, for me, yeah, again, just coming back to the, the, the all round performance of the bike, it was undermined by the live valve. I found it. Became, on the descents? On the descents. Yeah, I, I never got that impression on the descents, Henry, from it. I felt like just when I was doing my timed runs, when I was really pushing it, it felt predictably unpredictable. Really? There were just some times I felt I was getting pushed off line, mm -hmm. and it was almost always to do not with how the fork um, acted, but rather the rear suspension. Mm -hmm. I always felt my, as my weight just wanted to come forward, it would just like, like hitting a square edge and just getting pitched forward slightly. Mm -hmm. And then I put more weight onto my hands and it took a second or two to resettle. I wonder how much of that is due to the fact that we were running like, you know, 22, 23% sag, and the bike is just not as forgiving as other bikes. I mean, we have trail bikes where you could run 35% sag. There are 110 millimeter bikes out there right now. Companies say you can run 30-ish percent sag. I don't think, in my opinion, what the shortcomings of Live Alpha are something that's passively felt all the time. I'd rather say it's in one or two instances where suddenly, oh yeah, it's Live Alpha, <laughs> bloody hell. And, um, and rather, I would prefer it to see it more open more of the time. How did that, how did that affect your confidence, Henry? It, What's gonna happen? <laughs> yeah, it affected my confidence. I mean, um, it was on jumps that I really noticed it. On drops, it felt fine when you're already going downhill. On drums, especially when it had a long sort of, you know, a bomb hole into a into a lip, it felt not good. I yeah. felt consistently. Out. First of all, I thought it's just Squid Games. It's just me going over the handlebars. That's absolutely fine. Then it turned into, oh my god! Every time I jump this thing, I'm getting more and more over the front. So yeah. I did back to back runs, open, sport, and closed. And yeah, open was by far the most safe feeling. Henry, I'm just curious. You talked about not having confidence on the descents mm -hmm. with this bike and live valve. How did that translate to your times? Did it have the slowest time or? Yeah, it was the second slowest on the okay. time runs. And actually, I I definitely know where the time was going. There was this really fast left, right, both of which you put loads of load the suspension. And both times, every time I came out that right-hander after two consecutive loads, it felt like the, the bike didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> and I was mm. feel like I was pitched over the front. And then that subsequently cost a lot of time for the rest of the run out. And I felt like, both runs, we did, you know, the fastest of the two, and I really struggled to get anything like a predictable feeling coming out of that second ride. Mm -hmm. And is that from the suspension switching modes or something else going on there? It's hard to say. It felt like once you really loaded up the bike, you know, both in terms of loading up the tires and the suspension, it, it didn't really know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. It felt almost like it was, you know, you were hitting a wall of support. And like I said, then the weight was going into your hands and you were getting, you know, kind of doing a press up out of it. Um, yeah, like I said, predictably unpredictable. And the second one, I was thinking, you know what's going to happen here, you can handle it. And I couldn't ever really, those style of corners, get to grips on the giant. All right, I was digging into some of the component highs and lows in this bike. One thing it has, it's got in-frame storage, a little, can't call it a swap box, but do they have a name for it? I'm not really sure, but they probably do. Yeah. Yeah, to be completely <laughs> honest with you, Casimir. Um, but yeah, it's good to see that we finally have some in-frame storage on the Giant. More and more brands are doing this, but there are a couple issues with this. First off, the opening is so small that I couldn't get a tube into the down tube until I had to like unfold it so it was only like this thick and really long and then like gotta stuff it in like this, you know? Mm -hmm which risen, it's not really convenient. You'd be hard pressed to get any type of insulated jacket in there either. It's a pretty small opening. Um, the other thing is the latch for it is a dial that you turn and it means that the water bottle location sits a little bit higher up on the down tube. So yes, a normal water bottle fits, but it's kind of finicky to get in and out. It, it catches on the top tube. And if you want to run a larger bottle, you're out of luck. All right, Henry, were there any components that stood out to you in a good way, bad way? I mean, there's some really, it's a really solid spec on the Giant, actually. I yeah. think a lot of the components are the slightly burlier kind, the brakes are the slightly bigger kind, big rims, um, good seat post. However, I think the cable routing on this bike, in one word, is messy. I think the live valve, it becomes to overwhelm the front of the bike a bit. I know we're joking around, but it does a bit, look a bit like Neo when he gets released out of the Matrix and he's got cables coming out of every orifice. It's, it's a bit much. 
Um, you could probably need to it up. And one thing I did like about the Giant is for me, left hand rear brake, it's not internally guided. So I could run either, either which way. And thanks to that swap box, it shouldn't be that hard to internally boot either. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the drivetrain, we've got the return of some Praxis cranks. For better or worse, how'd that go? Um, I struggled to keep the chain on. It dropped on maybe three or four occasions. So then I ended up dialing the clutch an extra bit tighter. But then for me also, it, it compromised the shift. How did you go on leaving? Yeah, I didn't drop any chains, but the fact that we have a whole bunch of other bikes here with XT drivetrains, um, but different chain rings that are not dropping any chains, I mean, it kind of narrows it down to the chain being the issue there. So you might want to add a chain guide or change that chain ring down the road. Uh, another thing, Henry, that you've mentioned, there are some smart spec choices on this bike. You know, we complained about the weight a little bit. It's, it's over 29 pounds, but it has XT4 piston brakes. It has Giant's wide carbon rims. It has a dropper seat post that works really, really well. Even if I didn't like the remote, it worked well. Um, so overall, yeah, I think the spec choice has done pretty well. All right, now normally this is the point in the video where we'd start talking about the different models that are available, try to pick out the one that possesses the best value. But unfortunately, we don't have that information quite yet. So your best bet is to check out the link in the description, head over to the Pink Bike homepage, and you'll be able to find all the options and how much they cost. All right, let's go over some pros and cons. Levy, we'll start with you. How about some pros? Yeah, so first thing, I'm gonna start with the live valve. I know Henry had some issues with it and it's definitely not gonna be for everybody, but I will say it has greatly improved over the last version. So there you go. The other thing is there are definitely people out there who are gonna be into that kind of stuff. Technophiles who want cables and wires and microchips and things like that. Not really me, it's not Henry, but I'm sure you're out there. The other big pro, well, there's two of them actually. The first one, pretty smart geometry. I think it makes sense. And then the spec on the bike, Henry, mm. you know, it's got proper brakes, it's got proper rims, proper wheels, proper cockpit, dropper post works really well, like we've touched on. It just makes sense. Absolutely. I think the spec doesn't have any of the the, the weak spots that some yeah. of the other bikes have. The yeah. brakes are really good, the drop is good, and it has got internal frame storage, which yeah. is more than most of the bikes on test have. Sure. All right, well, let's go into some cons then. Take it away, Henry. I think for me, I think the live valve is a pro, it's a con. It really depends on your own personal tastes. Mm -hmm. Some people are really gonna like it. And I think it does do some things well. I think if you want a nice consistent seat traction, sure, if you wanna be pushing this bike really hard, maybe, maybe not so much. But Henry, we live in a place here where it's like, this is fairly demanding terrain out there. There are tons of places around the world where Live Valve, I think, is going to make sense, even for an aggressive trail bike rider. I think Live Valve would make sense, but does it make more sense than a bike with the correctly damped shock that's lighter and more simpler and cheaper? Touche. Maybe, maybe not. I think another thing that is going to put riders off wherever you are in the world is the weight. Yeah. This is a pretty heavy bike. It's only a couple pounds lighter than some sort of trail bikes. Coming in at ne nearly 30 pounds, like, I think it all adds up to be a bit too much. Well, Henry, who do you see this bike as being for? Who's the ideal candidate for the new Giant Trance? I think a good candidate for the Giant Trance is somebody who really loves their trail riding. Not so much XC and not so much Enduro and nothing too aggro. They just like covering you know, great swathes of ground in relative comfort, not like slammed at the front in a comfortable position. I think without the live valve, I might be saying something different. But with it, I would struggle to recommend it for someone that wants to do really aggressive things on a bike. Well, there you have it. That's the rundown on the brand new Giant Trance. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any more field test content. And we'll see you in the next video.